All right, I, uh, okay, it's a little late, uh, a little late on time here. Uh, I think it was worth it, though. So we are in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, and uh, we need God this morning, uh, one, because uh, a little less time than I thought, and two, because I didn't get as much time on this <laughs> this week as I normally do to prepare a sermon because I spent so much time getting ready for Friday night. We had a great time with the guys on Friday night. At least I think we did. I guess the wives know if it was effective or not, <laughs> depending on how he responded. But uh, I spent a lot of my week uh, pouring over h- hundreds of emails I got from the ladies in the church. Thank you so much, ladies. You guys, that was one of the most uh, uh, insightful things I've ever done. And I learned so much from you through that. Thank you. We as men uh, tried our best to listen to what you said to us uh, Friday night. We'll see how well we do applying it, but it was a great night and uh, spent a lot of time on that last week. I didn't know what to expect. I sent that email. I don't know if anybody would respond or not, you know, and, and uh, wow, like 10 minutes after I sent it, ding, 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 I never saw my inbox go like that before. Whoa, what have I done? And I promised you that I would read every one, and so I did. And, and then it, was, it took a long time. I'll just say that. But thank you uh, so much. Okay, so we're 1 Corinthians 8 today, looking at God's view of culture. If you're new to the church, we just preach through books of the Bible here. We've been at 1 Corinthians for a long time, going to be here uh, for quite a while yet. And we're looking at God's view of things. In 1 Corinthians 5, we look at God's view of sin. 1 Corinthians 6, we look at God's view of sex, bad sex, sex outside of marriage. 1 Corinthians 7, we look at God's view of good sex, sex in marriage. Also in 1 Corinthians 7, we looked at God's view of singleness. And then last week, we looked at God's view of uh, divorce and remarriage. Uh, uh, For sure, those sermons, 5, 6, and 7, I'm really glad to be done with chapter 7. Those sermons, back to back to back to back, some of the most brutal sermons I've ever had to preach, like, in a row anywhere ever. And I was thinking, you know, those those sermons probably cleaned, cleaned some seats out, you know? Like, those ones were rough. People were like, wow, they're serious about this stuff here. Like, they believe all that Bible stuff and expect a, We should have done the Saturday night service survey after that series, you know, to find out if we really will still need it. Uh, but I've been surprised as well by the YouTube stuff. Uh, the, ser- the sermon on bad sex, uh, uh, sex outside of marriage is sin, basically, has like 600 views. I, 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 and, then, and then the one on divorce has like 500 views, like the most brutal ones. Like you guys are amazing. I mean, you just want, you just like getting punched in the nose, don't you? I, I mean, this one's not that mean today. Sorry, you know. I'll see if I can work something a little harder up for you next week. But uh, I'm happy to be into chapter eight. So I'm gonna read a few verses, and we're gonna pray and dive in. Now about food sacrifice to idols. Remember, Paul is answering questions that they ask now. They ask this question about food sacrifice to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. So then about eating idol, food sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is no God but one. He, he says a lot about that. I'm going to go to verse 7. He says, but not everyone knows this. Not everyone knows that idols mean nothing. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think, it, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, their conscience gets defiled when they eat that food. But food uh, does not bring us near to God. We're no worse if we do not eat it, no better if we do. Be careful how you exercise your freedom, though. Do not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge, you know that it's okay to eat the meat. But they see you doing it, but their conscience is weak. Uh, you, they could be destroyed by your knowledge. They could be destroyed by, their, by your knowledge. When you sin against your brother in this way, you, you are sinning against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will not, never eat meat again, so I will not cause him to fall into sin. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would help us this morning, make this real, make this relevant, make this practical to our lives. Give us wisdom and give us insight. And uh, I just submit the whole thing to you. Uh, I got to submit this morning to you. Just sense that you're having your way. And so trust that uh, you will take these next 50 minutes or so and bring us exactly what you want us to have uh, through this text for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, they're asking two questions here to Paul. Uh, Can we eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols, number one, and can we go to the feasts uh, in the temples where they're sacrificing these idols? That's the questions they're asking. And really what we're looking at is God's view of culture. 
How does God view the culture that they lived in? Because this is, this is not a big deal to us, right? We're probably not asking these questions. So like, we're probably not thinking about should we eat meat that's going to sacrifice idols or not. And, and, but that's what they're asking because it's a big deal in their culture. And so what Paul is saying is, yeah, go ahead and eat the meat because it's meat. <laughs> of course God wants you to eat meat. That's why he made cows out of steak because he wants you to eat them. So he's saying, go ahead, eat the meat. And, and it might seem like a silly question, but to them it was a big question because it was a part of their culture. It's a very cultural deal. Uh, what they did back in that day, pagan worship and false idols were everywhere. And, and so they would take, uh, this was just was religion in Corinth. They would take an, a, a, an animal, kill it at a temple. It was always inclusive of immorality. They were shrine prostitutes. So this meat would get uh, uh, sacrificed to an idol. They would engage in immorality. And that's kind of how they worshipped back then. It was part of the worship. And the Corinthians grew up in that. And so now they're saying, well, hey, now we still live in this culture. That meat that was sacrificed to those idols, that's the meat that gets sold in the meat market. It was almost all the meat back then. So this was a real deal for them. Like, can I buy that meat and eat that meat because it was sacrificed to an idol? Or shouldn't I? Should I or shouldn't I? And, and what about all the feasts that go on? Because these feasts were everywhere. I mean, they're saying, can, can we go to those things? You know, all our friends still go there. Our families are still at those feasts. Are we not allowed to go to those feasts anymore because now we're Christians? So it's a big deal to them because it's very cultural. I mean, the whole, this is what the world did. And so are they not supposed to even be a part of those things anymore? You know, because these were big deals. These festivals were big deals. You know, it's, it'd, be, <laughs> it'd be like, like, like the, Horm, the Holman Corn Fest. You ever been to the Holman Corn Fest? It's a big deal. Oktoberfest, things like that. Big deals around here. Are we not supposed to go to those things because there's immorality there and beer tents and whoo, people rocking out with secular music? It's kind of those ideas are what they're saying. This was a big deal in their culture. Are they allowed to participate in those things uh, now that they're Christians? Are they supposed to avoid those things because they're Christians? And again, uh, there's lots of those issues for us. Now, uh, we may ask different questions today. Like, we were writing this to Paul today. Our questions might not be about meat sacrificed to an idol. It, but, but really what we're talking about is how to navigate our way as Christians in a non-Christian world and try to figure out our culture. How does God view our culture? What things can we engage in? What things can't we engage in? How am I supposed to be a Christian in a non-Christian world? And again, maybe the questions we'd ask today are, can we go to the bars and shoot pool with our buddies and have a couple beers? Can we go to movie theaters and watch R-rated movies? Can we listen to secular music? Can we go dancing or play cards or drink beer or get tattoos? Uh, you know, can we drive fancy, expensive cars, or is there a limit to how expensive the car should be because we're supposed to give money to the poor? Can I live in an expensive house, or, or can, I, can I drink coffee? Uh, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I smoke? Can I chew? Can I, whatever. There's a lot we could think about, right? Can I tan just for the sake of tanning, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of different things we could, we could say. There's a lot of different things that we could ask, and the reality is we all know this, the Bible doesn't speak to every one of those issues, does it? We don't have chapter and verse on those things, and the Bible can't. Because it was written 2,000 years ago. So the Bible gives us guidelines. I mean, God's pretty smart. He knew that he was writing this book for all people of all generations and all cultures and all times. So he doesn't, he, I mean, they didn't have the internet 2,000 years ago. He doesn't address Facebook, social, right? Because they didn't have it. And, and uh, 2,000 years from now, should the Lord tarry, which I highly doubt, but if we're still around 2,000 years from now, what are they going to be asking? What questions are they going to be doing? What's the culture going to be like then? And so what the Bible gives us is guidelines and principles as Christians to navigate our way through these very cultural issues. We're trying to discern what God would have us do, how he would have his people behave in areas that are very cultural. There are issues that aren't clearly laid out in the scripture. You can call them gray area issues if you want. In Romans 14, Paul calls them disputable matters. I call them neutral issues because Paul calls them neutral in verse 8. That's how he says it. Food does not bring us near to God. We're no worse if we eat, no better if we do. It's a neutral thing. It's a neutral activity. There's a lot of neutral things in our world, right? There are a lot of things that we could do. It's not going to make us closer to God. There's a lot of things we could do. It's not going to bring us farther from God. They're just plain old neutral. Now, some things are forward. Reading your Bible, praying and fasting, home in a church. It's, you're forward. You're going forward. You know you're engaged. Like, this is bringing me closer to God. There's some things that are going to take us farther from God. It's reverse. Looking at porn, sex outside of marriage, getting hammered drunk with your friends. I mean, so gossip and greed. Some things we know we're going backwards, right? Some forward, some backwards. Some things are just neutral. I know a lot about forward and reverse and neutral right now because I'm teaching my 16-year-old daughter how to drive, and it is terrifying. She's learning about neutral and forward and reverse, and I'm learning about trust and faith and, oh, God, help me. It's just I have more gray hair than I already have is coming to me in this season of my life. In any event, some things are forward, some things are reverse, some things are neutral. There's a lot of neutral issues in the world that we live in, right? There's a lot of things that you encounter in your culture on a daily basis, and you have questions. Can I do this? There's two questions that we need to ask, right? Can I do this? Is this sin? And then should I? Can I? Should I? And those are serious questions, and there's a lot of issues like that 
for us to try to navigate our way through as Christians in this world. How do we do it? How do we navigate our way through the neutral issues? There's two common errors that we need to avoid in the church, uh, uh, two ditches. On, there's, there's, a, there's a path, there's guidelines and principles that God has for us, and then on both sides of the path, there's a ditch. And there are, there are extremes on both sides of this issue. One is called syncretism, one is called sectarianism. Sectarianism is the ditch that I have fallen into more than once. Uh, syncretism, I can't say I've really ever spent a lot of time in that ditch, but I know a lot of friends and churches that have. But they're, they're, they're common ditches, they're common extremes. Uh, sectarianism is, you could define, I've, I've lived in the ditch of sectarianism. I know about this one from personal experience. You could call sectarianism the hyper-fundamentalism uh, or legalism that says that we should restrict ourselves from engaging in culture. Like God views culture as bad. God views all culture as bad. So if the culture's doing it, if the world's doing it, we're, 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 we're Christians, so we're not going to do anything that the world's doing, and that's how we know we're Christians, right? Because we don't behave like them, and we don't do the things they do. And it's, it, it's, uh, it's things like we, do, we don't get cable TV because cable TV is of the devil. I, I, I used to believe that. When I, was a, when I was first saved, man, I was so legalistic. I just thought cable TV was like the dark side. I missed the 90s. My, I, seriously, you can ask my what, Max, my oldest son. He'll look at my kids sometimes and go, you should have seen what dad used to be like. You guys got video games and cable TV now. <laughs> Max didn't have any of that stuff growing up because I was extreme over there, man. We're supposed to be separated from this world. I, I couldn't tell. We, my wife and I missed the 90s. I couldn't tell you one song that was on the top 40s, one movie, one TV show that was on. People ask questions about the. We played Trivia Pursuit in the 90s, come up with like, we don't know. <laughs> we missed the 90s. We checked out. We lived in this ditch called sectarianism in the whole 1990s. We were new believers, and we just that's the, what we got saved into, and that's what we thought. We're supposed to restrict ourselves from engaging in the culture. We're not supposed to listen to secular music and watch TVs and drink alcohol and hang out with non-Christians and separate yourself from the world. You hide from your culture. You build offensive rules and legalism that distinguish you from the world. That's how you know you're a Christian. You know you're a Christian because you don't behave like the world. And, and there are things that aren't in the Bible. The rules that we make. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't swear. Don't go to movies. The rules that we make up so that we know who's really in and then who's really not. And if they say they're Christians, well, they might say they're Christians, but we know they're really not because if they really were, they wouldn't drink, smoke, and swear. You know, it, it's just all that kind of stuff that we do. Now, is this the way to approach being a Christian in a non-Christian world? Obviously, I'm saying it's a ditch, so I'm saying it's not. Why do I think that? Well, let's look at what Jesus prayed in John 17, 15. I don't, do you guys have that? Yeah. Actually, I'm going to go a little further with it even. Uh, I'm going to flip over to John because there's a couple of verses I want to add to this. John 17, Jesus prayed this. And what Paul's doing is just lining up with Jesus. Jesus says this in John 17, 15. My prayer is Father, it's not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Don't take them out of the world, but protect them in the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. For them I sanctify, for them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Okay, so he's making a point here. He, we're supposed to be in the world. He says, Father, just as you sent me into the world, Jesus left heaven, came to the world, engaged his world, lived in his world. He says that's what, he, that's what he's praying for us. Just as you sent me, so I send them. Now, I want them to be in this world, but I want them to be protected from the world while they're in the world. And I, I, I think some of it for us is, is just Jesus understood that we were going to face these kinds of missionary cultural issues all throughout history as his people, that these things would arise, and he seems to not want us to run and hide from our culture, but rather to engage our culture in the same way that he engaged his culture. He wants us to avoid the holy huddle dilemma and the temptation to go underground and live in the Christian subculture and lose touch with our world, and it's easy to do that. It's just, it is. I, I mean, my goodness, there's Christian everything. Christianity has been marketed and, and, and it's sold, I and mean, you can buy Christian mints, you can buy Christian gum, you can buy Christian coffee, you can go to Christian preschool, Christian day, uh, daycare, Christian grade school, Christian middle school, Christian high school, Christian college, drive a Christian car, wear a Christian t-shirt, then get out of your Christian college and go work for a Christian organization and just listen to Christian music and watch Christian TV and Christian movies. That's, that, we, that exists. That, that, I lived it. I know it exists, man. You can live in that world and lose touch with the world that you live in. And part of this for us is understanding our call as believers, Right? Jesus was sent into the world, and he prayed to the Father. One of his last prayers is high priestly prayer. He's praying that just as he was sent, we'd be sent. He's sending us into our world. He wants us to be in our world. It's, it's, we are called to be missionaries, 
to the world that we live in. And I think sometimes that's part of our problem in America is the church, sometimes we don't see ourselves as missionaries to America, but we are missionaries to America, right? I mean, America is fastly becoming a non-Christian nation. In fact, America is becoming one of the nations that other nations are sending Christians to. They're coming here. We're now having, we used to be the great sending nation. Well, other nations are now looking at us saying, man, they're messed up. And the church isn't doing that much about it. So they're starting to send missionaries to our country to evangelize our country. We need to see ourselves as missionaries. You know, so often when we think of missions, we just think of things overseas, which we need to. We need to reach the world. We need to go to the nations, for sure. But we can't ignore all those people we're flying over as we get there, right? It's not just about going across the seas. It's also about going across the street and reaching the world that we live in. We are called to be missionaries right here. We're called to see our church as a mission base, a mission outpost. We exist to make a difference in our world, just like Paul did, just like Jesus did. And how did Paul and Jesus do it? Just read read their lives and study for yourself. It's Missiology 101. It's a philosophy of missions. Missiology 101. Jesus and Paul both did it. You need to know your culture so that you can use your culture to reach your culture. Know your culture, use your culture, reach your culture. You read Paul. Paul was brilliant. Paul understood the philosophies of his day, the arguments of his day. He could meet people right where they were. He knew what they were going through. He knew their felt needs, and he could speak right to it. So we need to know the world we live in. We need to know the felt needs of our community. I mean, one of the reasons that the thing Friday night was fun is because a lot of people felt that they could bring unsaved friends because um, it's it's a felt need. I mean, the average man is wanting to know how to have have a better life of sexual intimacy with his wife, saved or not. That's a real need that the world has. Marriage is a real need. That's something you can use to make an impact. That conference that we're doing, what a great opportunity for you to reach out to friends and people that you work with, non-Christians, because marriage and having a better marriage is a real need that everybody has, right? Saved or not, it's real, and we can use those things. Know your culture, use your culture, reach your culture. Jesus was the master, wasn't he? I mean, Jesus was the greatest missionary of all time. He left heaven. You talk about a Christian subculture, I mean, that's kind of heaven, right? He left it. He became a man. He took on flesh and blood. And he lived on this earth with real people. And he engaged them in their life. He knew them and he knew his world. And too often, if we're not careful, we can get sucked into the Christian subculture because we fall into the ditch of sectarianism and we just get out of touch with our world. It happens. It happens to individual Christians. It happens to whole churches. Sometimes the church is just so out of touch with this world. Have you ever gone to church and felt like you just stepped back in time 50 years? I'm really. I've, I've gone to church. and I've, I've gone to church and they're playing organ music. <laughs> I'm like, organ music? Oh, have you listened to the Top 40 recently? Anybody listen to the Top 40 ever? Anybody ever listen to the radio? Just turn When's the last time you heard organ music on the Top 40? Not a lot of that out there, is there? You hear the guy talking. He's so out of touch with his world. He's answering questions that no one's asking. And people leave going, I don't even, I don't even know what I don't know. What was he talking about? What was it? It seems irrelevant to their lives. We need to, and I don't think it's going to help you. For me to be so out of touch with our world that I can't speak to the real issues in our world, I don't think it's going to help you. Because where are you going tomorrow? You're going to work, right? So the guy leaves church. He says, I don't even know what that was about, what that guy's talking about, but I know I got to go to work tomorrow. And that's where you're going. You live in a real world. My job is to help you be equipped in a real world. And it goes for our children as well, right? We've got to equip our kids to live in a real world, to know their culture so they can use their culture so they can reach their culture. We have to equip. There's a, a, a statistic that drives me crazy and it's real. Three out of four kids that grow up in the church will stop going to church after they graduate high school. Three out of four. Cross the board. E-free, charismatic, non-denominational, it doesn't matter. I mean, cross the board. That's us, beloved, us. The statistics say that three out of four of our kids, when they get done with high school and they go to college, they're not going to church anymore. Now, at some point, they may come back. That should terrify all of us, yes? My gosh. And there's all kinds of reasons for it, and I've read all the articles, and one of the reasons, an easy one to give, is they weren't really Christians to begin with. That's an easy reason to give. I don't, and I mean, there may be some truth in that. If, if churches have youth pastors that are just afraid to tell kids the truth and get in their grill and call them to repentance, that's definitely not our issue. Our youth pastor might look crazy, he's tatted up everywhere, but man, oh man, he will tell our kids the truth. So that's not really the issue. A lot of times, I don't think, I've, I've had interviews with a lot of these kids because we had a Christian school in Madison where I pastored, and I, I, I met a lot of, I mean, a lot of kids that grew up in the Christian subculture, Christian day 
day, for real, Christian day, I'm not making this up, Christian daycare, Christian grade school, Christian high school, everything was about their church, they, they just lived in this thing, and what they said to me is they didn't feel equipped. They got out in the real world, and they were faced with all of this stuff, and they didn't feel like they were strong enough or equipped to deal with it. We've got to equip our kids to be able to deal with life in a real world. And you know, the other thing is, when Jesus said, come follow me, he said, I'm going to make you what? Come follow me, and I will make you what? Fishers of men. And I joke about this all the time. I don't fish. I, just, I especially don't ice fish. And I'm never going to. Some of you guys are trying to get me to go now. I'm not doing it. Unless you have a house out there with a heater and ESPN, then I'll go. Because that's not you fishing. That's you hiding from your wife. I know what you're doing. Now, hopefully you're not doing that as much after Friday, but that ain't fishing. But if you do go fishing, those of you, how many of you guys like to fish? There's a lot of you. You can, you can be honest, even though I don't like it, and I don't think it's a sport. But anyway, <laughs> if there's not a ball in pain, I don't think it's a sport. But in any event, uh, If you go fishing, where do you want to fish? Where there's fish. I know that. None of you are like, I'm going to try to find a spot on this river where I hope there's no fish. You go, unless you're hiding from your wife. (laughs) If you're really fishing, you go where the fish are. I went with this, uh, uh, Scott Tanky, he's an amazing fisherman. He's just amazing. And I went with him. He's, he knows where the fish are, and you guys are like that, those of you that fish. And, and you even know what kind of bait to use for the kind of fish you want to catch. It's amazing to me. I go, this is a bass. Whatever the fish is, I, that's the only name I know of a fish, a bass. I think there's certain kind of lures and bait that you use for specific fish you want to attract the fish, right? you got to know what they need, yes? you got to know your fish if you're going to catch your fish. This is simple. If I'm going to reach my culture, I've got to know my culture. I've got to engage my culture and meet my culture right where they are. We're called to be the light of the world. That's what we are. We are the light of the world. What is the purpose of light? To penetrate what? Darkness. So where should the light be? In the dark. I simple. Jesus said, oh, I'm not making any of this up. Jesus said all of this. To have all the light, all together, all the time, doesn't make a ton of sense. We are called to engage our world, to be a part of our world, to know our world, to know our culture, so we can use our culture to reach our culture and not be afraid in our churches to get rid of some of the sacred cows and traditions that we're all so used to for the purpose of reaching a lost and dying world for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, when we're out there, it's dangerous, though, isn't it? Let's be honest. This is where we run into all of these things, which leads us to the other ditch that a lot of people fall into, and it's called syncretism. Syncretism is just when we become so like the world that we have nothing to offer the world. It's the humanism and the liberalism and the tolerance of all behavior that has crept into much of the modern church. Fundamentalism, sectarianism, it's not going to reach the world. Syncretism, humanism, tolerance... Chucking the Bible and saying, hey, go for it if you want to. That stuff doesn't really apply to you anymore. And we start using our money just like the world. We start doing sex just like the world. We start doing marriage and divorce just like the world. Now we have nothing to offer the world. We're just like the world. That is the other extreme. It is equally dangerous. There is a path in between that's difficult, but we are supposed to walk in that path, beloved. And now, now there's some things, though, that, that we need to understand. As we're out there in the world, we're called to go and engage our world. Jesus prayed against syncretism too, right? Be in the world, but not of the world. Be in the world and protected from the evil. I mean, Jesus was a pretty good model of it, right? He lived amongst them. He loved them. He was one of them, and he didn't sin. So he was in it, not of it. And so when we're out there in the midst of it, we're going to come up against all of these things that we have to figure out how to navigate our way through. Now, some things we don't need to figure out how to navigate, right? Some things are already navigated for us. It's already clear. It's laid out for us. We don't need to think about it, don't need to talk about it, don't need to argue about it, don't need to debate about it. It's in here. Some things are just, oh, I just burped, sorry. (laughs) Don't put this one on YouTube. Scratching and burping and talking about sex and devils. What kind of pastor is this? Uh, uh, Some things are just always sin, right? They're always sin. Universal, I'm not, I don't want to get flex my brain, but they're just called universal sins. They're uh, always sins for all people of all cultures. It's universal. 
We don't need to talk about it. Now, some people don't like that because they want to make things, they want to make everything cultural, right? But some things are not cultural. They're universal sins. Sins for all people, for all times, in all places. We don't need to think about it, wonder about it, doubt about it. Sex outside of marriage is always sin. The Bible makes that clear. An active homosexual lifestyle is always sin. Getting drunk with your friends, always sin. Some greed, gossip, lying, always sin. Doesn't make me popular saying that. It's just true. I'm used to not being popular. They're universal sins. So those aren't the things we're talking about. Things that are main and plain in here that the Bible clearly says are sin. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about the many more, and there's many more issues that aren't addressed than are addressed. There's just a lot of issues in our world that are very cultural, and we need to find a way to navigate through these things, and we need to be careful as we do because they're divisive, and Paul knows that. It's incredibly divisive. It's already causing division in the church of Corinth. There's lines drawn. There's people on both sides of the should we eat meat or not eat meat issue, and it can be divisive. Strong personalities with strong opinions and very good cases to make on both sides of the ledger, but we should eat meat. We should eat meat. And it's clear from verse 1. He says it in verse 1. It's clear that both sides of the ledger knew stuff. You guys, you all know stuff, he says. They knew why they believed and what they believed. That They had very good reasons, very good arguments for their case, very good reasons to suggest why the other group was obviously wrong and deceived, and you're not spiritual. If you were, you'd believe like me. That never happens in the church today when we argue about Calvinism and Arminianism, things like that, but it happened back then. Paul says, we all know stuff. We all possess knowledge, and that can be good or that can be bad. In the case of the Corinthians, it actually appears to be bad, as crazy as that sounds, because knowledge, or let's just say knowing the Word, let's make it simple. Knowing the Word, knowing what the Bible says about every issue, knowing every scripture about every issue, it can be very helpful or it can be very harmful. How is it harmful? Well, if we're not careful in our pursuit of knowledge, and we should pursue knowledge, don't just take what I say and go, well, it must be true, Shane said it. A- again, some things are clear, we all have to agree, but some things are neutral. It- you got to know why you believe that for yourself. Study it for yourself. I tell you this all the time. Don't just believe what I say. Read it for yourself. Study it for yourself. I get terrified when people just believe everything that comes out of some guy's mouth. Know why you believe about what you believe and feel free to disagree with me. If it's not clear in here, you're free to disagree with me, but we're not going to fight about it, right? We're just not going to do that, but you're free to disagree. You need to know, we need to seek knowledge. That's the point. But in our pursuit of knowledge, if we're not careful, we can end up arrogant. Paul says knowledge can puff us up. That's how he said it. It can puff us up. It can give you a really big brain and a really little crusty heart. You can end up really, really smart and really, really mean. You can just turn into a Bible bully. I've met those guys. And that's not the purpose of this thing. Let me just make it real simple. If we have Bible knowledge and consider ourselves a Bible church, which we are, right? We're a Bible church. We're Bible people. And we lack love. We end up haughty, arrogant, self-righteous. And we end up using that knowledge to tear people down instead of building people up. The Bible is the sword of the Spirit, right? Sword of the Spirit. The only offensive weapon we have been given. What's the purpose of the sword of the Spirit? What's the purpose of it? It's some of what we did this morning for people. We, we want to bring freedom to people, right? That's the purpose of the sword of the Spirit. It's to bring freedom, the Word of God, to bring freedom to me, freedom to you, freedom and a message of hope to our world. The purpose of the sword of the Spirit isn't so we can fight each other. I wonder sometimes, like, I said, look at how these guys are always arguing with each other about all this stuff. They're taking their swords out, and we're just fighting each other and causing each other pain. That's not the purpose of the sword of the Spirit. It's to bring freedom and truth to each other and to the world, right? even to the world. We're not supposed to be using the sword of the Spirit just to the world around us. In John 3, 17, Jesus told us why he came to the world. He said, I did not come to the world to condemn the world, but to save it. He didn't come to condemn. He came to save. Jesus came in attention. He came in the middle ground between syncretism and sectarianism. And the middle ground he came in is called grace and truth. He came God on the earth in the flesh, and he came preaching both grace and truth. Not just grace, not just, yeah, do whatever you want and you're still loved. Not just grace, not just truth. Grace and truth. And that's a tension that we have to learn to walk in. I know it's not always clean. I know it makes this thing a little messy sometimes. I know some Christians get uncomfortable with that. But that is the place that Jesus walked. It's the message he came, grace and truth. And that's the message we are called to bring to our world. And I think one of the greatest examples of that has got to be Jesus with the woman at the well. Or no, the woman caught in adultery, don't you think? I mean, they catch this woman, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the one who knew more truth than anyone. You talk about smart guys and Bible bullies, they were it. 
They were at the top of the chain of Bible bullies. So they know everything, man. They got all the doctrine. They know more than anyone. They find this woman caught in adultery, probably in the act of adultery. And back in those days, if you get caught in the act of adultery, you're supposed to be stoned to death. So these religious leaders take this woman just out of adultery, throw her at the feet of Jesus, and say, okay, man of mercy, what do we do here? Just going to let her go? What are you going to do? They're trying to trap him. And, and the law says she should be stoned. What do you say? You're going to walk in truth? You're going to agree with the law? Are you just going to wink at it and say, go ahead and do whatever you want? Are you going to go to the ditch of sectarianism? Are you going to go to the ditch of syncretism? What are you going to do, Jesus? And what does Jesus say? Because Jesus was pretty smart. Did you ever notice that? That's the thing about God. He's pretty smart. He says, he says, I got an idea. Any of you that's without sin, you go ahead and throw the first rock. Let's go ahead and kill her. We'll kill her. We're going to kill her. First one that wants to, any of you that's without sin, you can start the execution. And then he reaches down on the sand and starts scribbling some stuff. Probably all their hidden sins, because they're Pharisees. They look good on the outside, but they're corrupt inside. So I think that's what he's doing. My opinion, you don't have to agree with that. And one by one, what do these guys do? They drop their rocks and they walk away. Because they know, they know, they're just, just as corrupt, they just didn't get caught, right? And so then what does Jesus say to the woman? Hey, he says to her, hey, where are your accusers? Is there no one to condemn you? And what does she say? No one, sir. What does he say? Well, hey, you're good to go. So what he says? He says, neither do I condemn you. Then what? I'll go and sin no more. I love you. I love you. Yeah, you're, we're all weak. We're all broken. We all got junk in our lives. And I love you. You're amazing. You're a daughter of the Father. You're fully accepted just like you are. Those guys aren't better than you just because they hide it. There's no one better than anyone else. And I love you, and you're amazing, and you're accepted. Now, go and stop it. That's what he says. It's grace and truth. And it's a tension that we need to learn to walk in, beloved. Too often, however, some of us set out on the great quest for truth and leave love behind. We arm ourselves with all the scriptures we can find about certain issues, and we just start destroying all the people who disagree with us. And, and people have been destroyed by that kind of truth. People have walked away from the church and even turned their backs on God because of that kind of truth. Again, the Pharisees knew more truth than anyone, and they ended up killing God. You talk about getting a big heart, a big head and a little heart. The Pharisees killed Jesus. However you slice it, that doesn't look good on your resume. And they were the smartest ones. They knew the Bible better than anyone. They were the most religious. And they killed God. Beloved, if we're not careful, we can just end up being plain old mean to each other and the world with our so-called knowledge. And if, we, and if we're not careful in our individual lives and even as a church, if we fall into that ditch of sectarianism over here and fundamentalism and we forget grace with truth and we're just about truth, we can end up defining ourselves and our churches by all the things we're not and all the things we're against. All the things we're against and all the things we pick it and we, we, we start to define ourselves. Well, we're not this and we're not that and we're against this. and we're. Against. I don't want my life to be defined that way. Jesus wasn't defined that way. His life wasn't defined by the things he was against. His, was, his life wasn't defined by the things he wasn't, was it? His life was defined by who he was, by what he did, by what he was for. That's how I want my life defined. That's how I want this church defined. I don't want this church known in this community for the things that we're against and the things that we're not. I want to be known in the lacrosse community for the things we are, for the things we're for, that we're for people, that we are a church of love, that we're committed to our community, that anyone can come here and find hope and healing and the love of Jesus, that we are a church who wants to use our resources to make a difference for the disenfranchised right here in our community and give our resources to bringing justice to the oppressed. I want us to be known for what we are and what we're for, amen? We don't want to be known for what we're mad about. I think God bless those guys. I just don't want to be one. And we can just be guilty of those things sometimes. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, he says. Let's be a people who seek knowledge for the right reasons so we can build people up and not tear them down. And if you are about the business of letting people know exactly what the Bible says about everything they're doing wrong, you may want to look at the fruit. Are you a Bible bully? I mean, just look at the fruit. Are people encouraged by your words? Are your children blessed and lifted up? Is your spouse, your friends, your coworkers, do lost people love to be around you? That's a good test. Or do people cower around you, afraid to be real and open and honest and transparent because they know you're just going to get out the sword and dice them up? I just don't think Jesus was like that. I kind of think people love to be around him, right? 
I kind of have this impression about Jesus that he was the kind of person you could share anything with and he'd be quick to love you and the correction he would bring would be with eyes of love and a heart of intense compassion. Knowledge with love, grace and truth. It builds people up. In fact, the only people you ever see Jesus really mad at and taking the billy club to was who? The Pharisees, those same guys, the ones that ended up killing him. They seemed to not like each other. It worked both ways. So seek knowledge, just use it the right way. And know this, according to verse 2, Paul says, if you think you have all the answers, you don't really yet know as you ought to know. You might know, just not as you ought to know. So you have knowledge, you just don't know what you really need to know, you don't know it the right way. So you can know something, but you might, know, you might not know as you ought to know. Interesting verse to me. What does it mean? It means a couple things. Number one, it means even if you happen to be right, if you don't have love, you're wrong. First Corinthians 13. You can have all knowledge, and if you lack love, you gain nothing. You're resounding gong, clanging cymbal. You can have all the truth in the world. If you don't have love with it, he says you have nothing, you gain nothing. We will spend weeks in 1 Corinthians 13. This is important. And I learned this early in my relationship with my wife, right? Even if I was right, I could be wrong. Know what I'm saying, guys? Like, I mean, imagine being in an argument with me, right? I mean, I, I can't, Vicky's not good with her. She doesn't talk fast and think fast on her feet. And so there's so many times early in our marriage, and I used to have serious anger and rage issues Woo! So those of you that struggle with anger and rage and think there's no hope, there's hope, there's freedom. I used to, you can ask her, man, I was just, it was like the Hulk. And so we'd have these arguments. And, and sometimes, even if I was right, she would cry because I would just steamroll her in the argument, right? So even if you're right, guys, if your wife cries, you're wrong, right? You lose, she wins. I just learned this early on. You can be right and be ruining people. You can be right all day long. If your rightness is ruining relationships and hurting people, then you're wrong. I say this to guys all the time. Their, their wives hate them, their kids are afraid of them, and they're, they're belly aching to me about, yeah, but I'm right, yeah, but I'm right. I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. Be right. That's great. How's that working for you? How's life with your wife? Uh, we'll put that on your tombstone. Here lies the guy who was right. He was alone. His wife hated him. His kids were afraid of him, but he was right. If you're right the wrong way, then you're wrong. Number two, it's possible that a sliver of what you believe to be true about every issue might not, in fact, be 100% accurate. <gasps> it is possible that you might not be entirely right. Some of you guys are like, what? It's true. In other words, you could be wrong. Remember Fonzie? Can you even say it? Ruh, ruh. Some of you guys are like, oh, I'm not wrong. You need to learn to say the word wrong. You might be wrong sometimes about certain things that you have strong convictions about if they're not clearly laid out in the Word of God. Just because you have a strong conviction about it doesn't mean you're right, and that's what they're fighting about. They're fighting about neutral issues. And they have strong convictions, so they must be right. Well, you might not be right. Just because it's right for you doesn't necessarily mean it's right for your wife. Just because it's wrong for you doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong for your brother or sister in Christ. And that is the point that Paul is trying to make. You need to know as you ought to know. I'm not promoting moral relativity, am I? Why? Because some things are always sin for all people and all times. Those are called what sins? Universal sins, right? So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the neutral issues of verse 8. He said it in verse 8. Food is neutral. It's not better. It's not worse. Okay, so how do we figure it out? How are we led by these neutral issues? Two quick thoughts. One is by conscience and one is by love. It's in verses 4 through 8. And then in verse 7, he's beginning to help them know as they ought to know. I'm not going to read it all again. You can read it for yourself later. Not just with facts, but with love. Okay? He says, he says hey, not everyone knows that food is neutral. That's what he's saying. Some people are still accustomed to idols when they eat such meat, so their conscience is weak, so they feel defiled if they eat the meat, right? Like, 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 like uh, going to the bar to shoot pool and have a beer. Is that a sin? No. You want to go to the bar, have a beer, shoot a game of pool? It's not a sin. Now, if you go to the bar, shoot a game of pool, have a, have a beer, and then you want to have 10 beers and, and be immoral and act like an idiot, and, or, or, then, it's, then you shouldn't go, right? Or if you go to the bar, have a beer, and you leave, and you feel defiled, you feel yucky, like, ugh, I just feel like I need to go home and take a shower. You know that feeling I'm talking about? Your conscience is defiled. That's God's way of saying to you, don't go there. Now, you may go with your friend, and your, your friend loves the Lord, and he doesn't have that feeling. It's not, then it, leave him alone. It's what he's saying. We need to be led by our conscience. That's what he's saying. And he wants both sides to get this. Some people are weak in the area of eating meat, 
Some people are strong. He wants both sides to get this. And, and the main way that we're led in these issues is by our conscience. I, I, I know it would be easier if I just gave you a list of rules. I'm not going to give you a list of rules as it pertains to the neutral issues. You have to be led by your conscience. That legalistic, sectarianistic, fundamentalistic Christianity that some people live, where the leaders just give them a list of do's and don'ts, it might make it easier, it might make it cleaner, but it militates against a real relationship with God, and you never need to learn to be led for yourself in those areas, right? You need to be led by your own conscience. Your conscience may lead you to say yes to something that my conscience may lead me to say no to something, and so we can't just legislate it for all people. Does that make sense? It, it just simply means if you feel yucked by a neutral activity, or just the thought of doing it makes you feel yucked, your conscience is defiled, don't do it. I think we all know what that feeling is. God gave us a conscience. We're supposed to be obedient to our conscience and let other people be obedient to their consciences, right? That's, that's, that's really what he's getting at. Some of the people there were strong. They could eat the meat and they didn't feel bad about it. Why? I don't know. They just were strong in that area. We're all strong in some areas and weak in some areas, right? In verses 9 through 13, his point to the strong is, if you flaunt your freedom, you can stumble the person who has a weak conscience. They see you doing it, and they kind of feel like it's okay for them to do it. You know, like, hey, Shane's eating meat in the idol's temple. Why can't I? And so they see me doing it, even though their conscience is telling them they shouldn't. They go, well, Shane here's God too, and, and that looks fun, and I'm going to do it anyway. But their conscience is telling them they shouldn't. So he says, my weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by my knowledge. Which means, again, what? Everything I just said. Knowledge without love can destroy, even if I'm right. Who cares if I'm eating in an idol's temple? Who cares if I'm shooting pool and having a beer at the pub? Who cares? Idols aren't real. Even the material they're made of comes from God, so you know idols are goofy and meaningless. What's it matter? Well, your weaker brother could be destroyed by that truth. It is true. But if you don't know as you ought to know, he can be destroyed by your knowledge. What does it mean that they can be destroyed by my knowledge? Does it mean they're killed, they're lost forever, they're going to hell? It just means I'm leading them down a slippery slope. See, if someone disobeys the internal moral compass called the conscience, then little by little they become harder and harder to that voice, and pretty soon they can't hear it anymore, and they end up engaging in all kinds of activities that God is trying to help them avoid, and it can lead them to a bad place. Verses 12 and 13, he brings in the love factor. We need to understand that we're sinning against them, conscience and love. So love needs to trump. Paul said, therefore, he said, he said I won't eat meat if it causes my brother to, to stumble. So if you're a recovering alcoholic, or I'm a recovering alcoholic, you're not going to invite me to B-dubs for wing sports and beer, right? You're not going to do it because you love me. You're going you're to say, ah, we do something else. We're going to go, do, we'll go somewhere else. It's, just, it's really simple stuff, you know? If you're a vegetarian, I'm not going to invite you over to my house for barbecue, right? It's just, it's just simple stuff. I don't know why you're a vegetarian, but God bless you. What he's saying is, I can be strong in that area. Maybe beer's not a deal for me. Well, maybe it is for you. Maybe it is for me. I'm not saying. You don't need to know. I would curtail my freedom for your sake, though, because it's about love. I, so, so, Shane, are you saying that we need to be led by someone else's conscience? Is that what you're saying? I can't have a beer if it's not a sin for me simply because someone who struggles with it and is a believer might stumble? The answer to that is yes and no. Does that help? Yes and no. Yes, as it pertains to being seen, is what he says in verse 10. He says, if you're seen. He's not saying it's wrong. He says, if you're seen. Now, add to that chapter 10, uh, verses 25 through 27, and you get a very confusing contradiction. Verses 25 through 27, he says, eat anything sold in the meat market. What? But you just said in chapter 8, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That's a contradiction to what he just said. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever's put before you without raising questions of conscience. You had 1 Timothy 4, verses 4 and 5 of that, where he says, hey, everything God gave, he gave for us to enjoy. You put all that stuff together and you get a very contradictory message. Because Paul says, go ahead and eat whatever you want without even raising a question of conscience because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And he's exhorting us to eat and drink whatever is set before us if we're with an unbeliever. It seems like a contradiction to what he just told us in chapter 8 about, hey, I'll, I'll limit my freedom if it's going to cause someone to stumble. It does seem confusing, so he takes it by the horns in verses 29 through 32 of chapter 10. We're going to read that and wrap this up with this, and hopefully it will make sense. Hopefully we can land this airplane. Okay, here's what he says. We're going to try to land this puppy. He says, uh, the other man's conscience, I mean not yours, could be defiled. It's weak. 
For why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews or Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of the many. Okay? So what's Paul saying? The Reader's Digest version, for the sake of time, is this. If you are in the privacy of your own home or amongst people who will not be stumbled by your convictions on neutral issues, go for it. That's what he's saying. Go for it. Now, does that mean you live two lives? Does that mean you're phony? No, it's not what he's saying. It's about preferring your weaker brother better than yourself. It's simply God's way of wanting you to know that you're really free and that you do not have to be held in captivity by another person's conscience. You don't have to be bound by my conscience. I don't have to be bound by your conscience. But at the end of the day, what matters most? Love. Love matters most. Paul's life looked like a contradiction, doesn't it? You read Paul. You study Paul. When he's with the Gentiles, he'll eat and drink whatever's set before him. When he's with the Jews, only which is kosher, he's not. Gonna, he's he's going to change his behavior based on who he's with. He's not trying to be phony, but rather, as he said in verse 33, he was trying to please everybody and seek the good of others, not his own good. Why? So that they all may be saved. If eating and drinking was going to help bring him in, bring it on, Paul said. If eating and drinking is going to keep him out, then keep it away. It also is God's way of wanting both the weak and the strong in certain areas to know this is not about maturity. you got to understand this. You can be weak in areas of your life and still be a very mature Christian. You can be strong in areas of your life and be a very immature Christian. To be strong and mature means I recognize I'm free to engage in this activity, but I'm going to love my brother or sister enough to not engage in this activity for their sake. I'm strong and mature. I can be strong and immature. I can be, I can be strong. It's, I'm good with this. It doesn't bother me. I can have a couple beers. It's not going to make me want to have 15 like it is some other people. So, so, what's, so what's the big deal? Get over it. Stop judging me. Why should I limit my freedom because of you? Get lighten up, loosen up, you self-righteous, hypocrite Christian. And so now I'm strong, but I'm immature because I'm not loving you. I'm flaunting my freedom and throwing it in your face. That is being strong and immature. So I can also be weak and mature. You can be weak in 50 areas and be mature. You know, when I was a new believer and I was growing into this thing, I thought to be mature meant I would never be weak in areas. Wow, it doesn't take long to figure out it doesn't work like that, right? You can be mature and weak. To be mature and weak means to recognize your areas of weakness and build fences around those things and not do those things. It means to recognize I'm weak in those areas and I'm not going to defile my conscience by doing those things. I can be incredibly mature and incredibly weak at the same time in certain areas. Or I can be weak and immature. Weak and immature is I know I'm weak, I can't do it, so I get mad at you and I judge you because you are doing it. Now, and I think you must not really be spiritual and you must not really be a Christian because you do go to the, now I'm weak and immature. Does, does that make sense? And it's a problem. The, the, the strong are being rebuked by Paul for flaunting their freedom. The weak are also being rebuked by Paul for judging the strong. And they're reading this together. I mean, they read this book out loud together, so they're all being rebuked together. So even the weak are being rebuked. And it happens, and sometimes we do this stuff where we're weak in certain areas, so we want to legislate it to everyone, right? We're going we're gonna to make everyone be bound by our conscience. Whole denominations do it. I could name two. I won't name them because I don't want to be divisive. But there's two denominations that they say alcohol is a sin. And, and, and to be a member, to be a pastor in their denomination, you have to sign a covenant that says you'll never ever drink alcohol. And to be a member of one of those churches, you have to sign a covenant that says you'll never drink alcohol. And I know this is true. And I, they're still my brothers, and I'll do stuff with them. And I got friends that pastor those churches. But one of those denominations, when I was planting a church, it was growing really fast, and we were non denominational. I was always non denominational before I was here. And there's pros and cons to denominations. One's not better than the other. It's, that's definitely a neutral issue. But I was always non denominational. So uh, the denominations were always courting me, trying to get me to bring my church into their denomination. Some of those reasons were good, so we could partner together. Some of those reasons were bad. They just wanted growing churches in their denomination. And, and so, so, so I was getting courted by this one specific denomination, and it's awesome. And I'm thinking, man, this, these guys are great. We can co-labor with these guys. Uh, this is exciting. And I was with their leadership, and they're, you know, we're doing all this talk, and then the alcohol thing comes up. And I don't even know how it came up. And I, I say to the guy, I say, what did you just say? Like, I got to tell guys that helped me plant this church that run businesses, that love God, they're completely godly, that they can never, ever, ever have a beer or a glass of wine with their wife ever again unless in order to be a member of the church they helped me start. <laughs> what? 
That's insanity. I mean, we had a home brew in Madison. It was a big deal. People made their own beer. We had the best home brew guy. He was known in our city. He was like the home brew guru master guy. He was a member of our church. He did a class in our church teaching guys how to make beer, you know? Because I used to tell guys, it's not a sin to drink beer. It's a sin to drink bad beer. So this guy's definitely a sin to drink light beer. Now, for some of you, it's a sin to ever drink beer, right? If your conscience says it's not for you, then it's not for you. But if your brother wants to have a beer, he can have a beer, right? He's not, he doesn't need to be bound by your conscience. It's just, and I'm telling him, I can't do that. I, I could never do that. I don't care if I ever have a beer again as long as I live. But based on principle, I'm not going to do that because it's me telling people you're going to be immature and I'm going to think for you. Our denominational leader is going to think for you. That is absurd. I just have this weird idea that the Bible is sufficient. And if the Bible doesn't forbid it, why should I? I'm going to set myself, as some, set myself up as some little demigod and I'm going to decide for all of us because that's how it works. Some guy has a weakness in his life. Some leadership group has some weaknesses in their lives, so they set up the rules for everyone. Well, I guess I could do that. I don't, you know, I could just be the demigod. I'm going to tell us all what's right and what's wrong based on my conscience. And then if I have a conscious change, like if I think cable TV is bad for me right now, none of us could cable TV. But if that changes, I can have a change of conscience too, as can you, right? I've had those things in my life. God says no right now, and then a year later, I go for it, and a year after that, no, don't. So every time I have a change of conscience, then you have a change of conscience, right? I think for you. That's just absurd. I'm not making this stuff up, beloved. This stuff happens. Whole denominations think for people and make them be bound by their conscience. Since I've been at this church, it's two and a half years in, I've had at least three, three that I remember, three conversations with people, and I'm, I'm just using alcohol because it's an easy example. It's just a big one, especially in this culture. Woo! People like to drink in the cross, man. And so it's, just a, it's a big one. And so I've had three conversations with people in, it, since I've been here that said they wouldn't come to this church or become members of this church because we have people in this church that drink alcohol. And I said, okay, well, okay, see ya. <laughs> well, I don't know what I'm supposed to say to that. Like, and I, so, so I say to them, no joke, I've had this conversation. And one guy was really intense and really, really wealthy. And I said, so if I say to the church on Sunday they can never drink alcohol again, and they have to sign a covenant saying they'll never drink alcohol to be a member here, then you'd start coming here? <clears throat> you'd become a member? But <clears throat> probably that would really help. That would really help us a lot. Probably. It's okay. Well, okay. That's your conscience issue. So then what do I do if someone else comes and says, I don't think we should have cable TV? Is that another law we make? Do I make that a rule? And then what do I do if someone else comes and says, they don't think we should ever buy a car that's over more than 20000 bucks? You going to get rid of your $50,000 ride, dude? Because they might have a conscience issue about that. In fact, I got people in my church that might think we should only ride bicycles because they're environmentalists. You're going to sell your car and walk to work every day? What if I got people in my church that say they believe they should never eat meat? You're going to give up meat? What if I say uh, people in my church that say they should never have a house that's worth more than 200000 because we should give all our money to the poor and actually care about social justice and use all of our resources for the poor? Then are you going to sell your, your $500,000, $600,000, $700,000 house or whatever it is and go live in a $200,000 house because of their conscience? And at this point, the guy's like, dush, 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 you know, and I was just both barrels, man. I'm like, this is ridiculous. How about we just let the Bible be the Bible? And how about we're just all led by our own conscience as it pertains to these neutral issues and give our brothers and sisters in Christ freedom to be led by theirs as well. Amen? Amen. Now, unless you're a kid living at home, then your parent is your conscience, okay? Okay? No, for real. Look, because some kid's going to go home and, and turn on some movie, and, and your dad's going to be like, what are you watching? You can't watch that, and you're going to go, free in Christ. Free in Christ. He should just say, not in my house, you're not, and you need to listen to him. I am the conscience for my children, okay? You're a kid living at home. You obey mom and dad. You, they, they are your conscience. I tell my kids all the time, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, we're going to miss you around here, though. Yeah, go ahead. I say, they hear it all the time. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, we're going to miss you here, but it's going to save me some money on food. Go ahead. Yeah, you can do that when you're paying the mortgage of your own house. You can do whatever you want. My house, my rules. My conscience rules in my house, right? So if you're a kid living at home, you need to obey mom and dad. You also need to obey the law, okay? Kiddos, if you're under 21 years old, do you need to pray about whether or not you should ever drink alcohol? No, why? It's illegal. It's against the law. You don't need to pray about it. It is not a conscience issue for you. It is a matter of legality. If you're under 21 and you're drinking and you're a Christian, you are sinning. And, 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 and all the pot smokers in America, there's only two states it's legal in. Not even sure it's really legal there, okay? So that's another one. That one always came up when I was in Madison. People always want, well, I can smoke pot because pot's not doing any 
damage. <laughs> Actually, I think it is, but you're stoned. I have pot smokers all over the place. I, 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 I get, it, it, <laughs> this guy's just cracked me up. <laughs> right? I just, I guess it's against the law. It's against the law, so it's, it's not a moral issue. If it's ever legal, for real legal, in our nation, like, and you can just go to the store and buy it, it's a different issue. Then it's a moral issue. Today it's not a moral issue. Now people say, well, then what about homosexuality? What if that becomes legal? It's not a moral issue. It's, a, it's not a cultural issue. It's a universal issue. The Bible is clear about it. We're not going to debate it. I, I have these questions. I, have people, I mean, I have real conversations with real people all the time. I say, well, what about when homosexual marriage really is the deal and the whole nation does it? Then are we a part of that? I say, no. We still say it's wrong. They say, yeah, but then it's legal. Well, the Bible says it's sin. It's, I, don't, it, I didn't write it. It just says it. We just submit to God's word. It doesn't address pot. It just doesn't. Now, they, some guys think it, do, it does, and they have these little obscure scriptures, you know, about Moses and the burning bush and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> they... I've heard it all. I have heard it all. So the Bible doesn't address pot. If pot's really legal, I, that's a different conversation. It's one I just hope we don't ever have to have, quite honestly. Does that make sense, though? We're not talking about universal sins. There, there are some things in our culture that are legal. Well, the Bible trumps it, okay? And, and, and if it's not a law issue, it's a conscience issue. I can keep going all day. i got to stop. i got to stop. I'm gonna stand up. I'm going to pray for you get you out of here. I just, I just fire hose you guys this morning, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us enough uh, to want us to grow up and have a real relationship with you and be led by love and our conscience. And I guess more than anything, that's what you want us to leave here with, that we're all supposed to be led by love for our weaker brothers and sisters, uh, I pray for all the young ladies here. That they'd think about that as it pertains to the way they dress. That they would let love rule the day. They know their brothers and brothers in Christ as young guys are visual. I pray they would let love rule when they get themselves ready in the morning. I pray for husbands and wives that have disagreements on neutral issues. That they just give each other room to be led by their own conscience. And they prefer each other better. And let love win the day. Pray for us as a church. I pray that we'd never let trivial, neutral issues uh, become divisive here. That we just wouldn't allow kind of worship or church government or all that kind of stuff. We just, we just want to let it happen. Calvinism versus Arminianism, gifts of the Spirit. And we just wouldn't allow those things to be uh, divisive here. That love would win and that love would rule in this house. And that we would give each other freedom. That we would really give each other room to be led by conscience as it pertains to these neutral cultural issues that we all face every single day. I also pray that we would always be a church, always, always, that we would always be a church that submits to your word and never backs down from those universal issues that are clear to us. No matter what our culture does, no matter what our culture says, that we would be obedient to you, that you would not allow us. We ask for your help. We know we're just people. We know it happens to lots of churches. We don't want to be one. So we're asking you to help us not fall into the ditch of sectarianism and be those hyper-fundamentalists that beat everyone up. And we ask you to help us not fall into that other ditch of syncretism where we just become those, those, those liberal humanists that say everything is fine with God. And just give us grace to walk in the tension. We ask, Lord Jesus, the tension that you walked in, of grace and truth, towards each other and towards this world, I ask for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. See you next week.